everyone. Thank you for joining Revenpack's first 2021 episode of the live chat with the expert series. Today, we will be talking about COVID-19 and its impact on global stock prices. Before we begin, I would like to say on behalf of Revenpack and our speaker today, that the human and economic costs of the pandemic have been immense and our thoughts are with those whose families and personal situations have been greatly affected by the crisis. Without wishing to make light of all the tragedies that have accompanied the pandemic, today's webinar will be on the financial aspect of the crisis. As many of you know, Revenpack is a leading provider of news analytics for financial services. Last year, when COVID hit our planet, we decided to leverage our proprietary text analytics technologies to create a publicly available dashboard that people could use to monitor in real time, globally or by country, the latest trends, media coverage, sentiment, and themes like panic and fake news distilled into simple indicators from tens of millions of news articles and public posts. Today, we will be discussing some recent research that has leveraged the sentiment and panic indexes from Revenpack's coronavirus media monitor in order to measure the impact of COVID-19 on global stock prices. In particular, we will look at how stock markets have integrated COVID-related news chatter and whether local, global or US information was more important in driving the markets. To discuss this, I have with me one of the co-authors of this research, Dr. Yongju Kang, who is currently Assistant Professor of Finance at Thomson Rivers University School of Business and Economics located in Canada. His research speciality is in asset pricing, macrofinance, market microstructure and derivatives. However, Dr. Kang is not just an academic. Prior to his doctorate, he worked for over 15 years in investment banking and financial consulting, where he was the head of structuring for South, Af South Korea at Barclays, Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse. Dr. Kang has a PhD from Yonsei University, an MBA from New York University, an MSc from Stanford University and a BSc from UC Berkeley. And I'm in Nagrinis. I joined Revenpack in July last year as a senior data scientist and quant researcher specialized in global macro investment strategies and macroeconomics. Before Revenpack, I worked for three years at Goldman Sachs in London in the consumer and investment management division as a macro researcher. And I hold a PhD in economics from the LSC and the BA from Cambridge. Before we start in terms of logistics, um, we'll spend around 30, 40 minutes discussing Dr. Kang's research and then there will be a live 10 minutes Q&A session. So please post your questions along the way through the GoToWebinar platform. You will see we also have some resources available for you to download on the right side of the screen. This includes the slides prepared by Dr. Kang for today's session, a video introducing our coronavirus media monitor, and two recent papers from our quant research team. One where we show that sentiment-driven strategies significantly outperform random portfolios during volatile periods such as COVID, the Great Recession, and China's related 2015-2016 sell-off. And another one summarizing 14 recent academic papers that have used Revenpack data in risk management applications. Please download these resources if you are interested before the end of the webinar. And now, without further ado, let me turn to our speaker. Hello and welcome, Dr. Kang. How are you? Hello. Nice to meet you and thank you for that great introduction. Uh, I guess I'm happy to be here to talk about my research and to show how I've uh, integrated and used Ravenpack data to have a deeper look into the impact of this current pandemic on global stock prices. Perfect. Um, we are very excited to have you with us. I mean, it's we have over 100 different academic studies that have been done with our data, and it's always very exciting to see how people apply our data, use our data. Um, so as a start, could you please give us um, a quick overview of the research question you're addressing and tell us a bit about why you decided to use Revenpack? So our research was motivated by a curiosity to better understand and assess how stock markets would have integrated public information on related to the coronavirus. So 
that could be both on a local as well as regional, global, or US basis. And the main sort of understanding is that although viruses might be cut off from one country to another through various government measures and travel restrictions, the news about the virus will still be contagious throughout the world's stock markets, especially given the digital age that we're in. So we incorporate these news element into our analysis using the Raven Pack indices. And what we hope to understand is what the drivers of global stock prices were during the pandemic. So what type of information, was it infection or news chatter that was more pertinent or whether local, regional, global, US information were the primary drivers of prices. In our analysis, we run cross-country OLS as well as pooled panel regressions on 48 countries around the world using different variables for the core to incorporate the COVID-19 related information and control for various government, government measures taken in response to the pandemic. So here you see a general equation that we use. We modify for each different um, variation that we run, but basically we have the stock return of, on the local stock market on as your main dependent variable on your left-hand side. And we also have on the right-hand side are independent variables related to either panic indices, sentiment indices, or some other COVID-19 infection-related uh, information, as well as a third variable here you see here in terms of the global, uh, where we incorporate news from other regions, not purely from the local side. And we, as I mentioned previously, we test alternatives to using just the global with using the US data, as well as regional and sub-regional data as well. And in terms of the pooled regressions, um, we do do it for a few different distinctions or regions. The first would be the developed versus emerging countries. And and of course, looking at regionally, the Americas, Europe, and Asia, and to see whether or not there's differences in these, uh, in the relationship between information as well as stock price movements. That's very interesting. So basically, you're trying to see whether the actual virus contagion captured by infection and reproduction rates is priced differently by the markets from the COVID news contagion. Um, I think it's it's a very cool idea and actually makes me remember one of our clients who built economic growth newscasting models based on rev impact sentiment about growth related topics. And when they were contrasting these newscasting models with now casting models based on more standard economic data, they were referring to this idea of news adding a layer of interpretation to the actual economic data. So in your case, it's like um, you're trying to understand whether COVID news discussion was priced differently from more hardcore, say, data like infection reproduction rates and look a bit at which uh, which regionally which which countries were more significant and whether local versus global or US effects were were more significant. I'm I'm curious, like when you were designing this project, did you consider any other data providers? For instance, I know that economic policy uncertainty indexes are also partly based on news, or maybe you could also have used something like Google Trends. So can you tell us more about why you decided to use Revenpack? Oh, definitely. I guess uh, I guess just to start off, I guess initially when I first started doing this research with my co-authors, we were actually trying to collect manual, I guess, manually from all the news sources on trying to understand or get a sort of like a measure for the sentiment in the in the market, uh, and that turned out to be a little bit more cumbersome as well as more difficult to sort of use in a structured format. And that's why we sort of gravitated towards using Ravenpack's indices since they started became, uh, we noticed that they were becoming available since March. Um, in terms of other data, like Google mobility data or the EPU, the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, uh, we have considered them as well. But we find that the Google mobility data is more is sort of incorporated into the Ravenpack indices and also 
the fact that it's very specific to a specific type of information, which is whether or not people have travel restrictions or they're not really they're not allowed to move around or have curfews due to lockdowns. And I think for the EPU's case, it was not sufficient enough in frequency for us to do our analysis. Uh, as you know, the, the coronavirus is still ongoing and the data set that you can use is only for the year 2020 from say at earliest from January, if you wanna capture the early onset of the pandemic up until now, right? So um, using uh, the EPU data that only has monthly date, data sets, it's not sufficient for you to actually capture everything or the variations in sentiment and stock price movements that you'll see on a daily basis or even intraday basis. Now for Ravenpack, we were able to get intraday data as well, which allowed us to sort of, I guess, modify and sort of enhance and test in addition to just using the daily data. Of course, our main results are, are done using the daily data for, uh, that's provided, but we can also test for market timing based on market hour close for the different geographic regions using the intraday data and timestamps that you have provided us with. So, so going into the Ravenpack indices, um, we selected two specific indices from the coronavirus monitor, which is the Ravenpack's panic as well as sentiment index. And from this, I guess the panic is sort of measuring the news chatter on any reference to panic and hysteria. And sentiment is more um, looking at entities and measuring across uh, whether or not the sentiment levels have changed. And this is the, a snapshot of the monitor itself. So the panic index is shown here. And I guess the country index is shown here. And if you compare how panic index has performed, I guess, comparing it in terms of correlation wise to new confirmed cases, um, you'll see that panic increases as new coronavirus cases increases. On the other hand, sentiment, as you expected, it, it actually improves when coronavirus decreases. As you can see here, when it's dipping down, you can see the sentiment index improving. So this, we felt that using the two would give us a sort of overall view of what the general views and global sentiment and would be it on panic or, sent, or general sentiment that we can actually analyze in our analysis. We do also use different um, additional uh, measures uh, besides the panic and sentiment indices, uh, such as the reproduction rate or zero, as well as the weekly growth in new confirmed cases or what we, we have called the infection rate, which is essentially the one week difference or log one week difference of new confirmed cases. And the government measures we have sort of incorporated into our analysis in response to the pandemic, we have taken from ACATS. Yeah, I actually want to quickly go back to a very interesting point you made, um, mm -hmm. because very often we have firms that want to start using alternative data, but they don't know whether they should look at mobility data, job postings, credit card transactions, and as you said, like news actually have this big advantage of being so universal. I mean, we track almost 7,000 different event categories and these span topics like business, economics, politics, environment, society, you name it. And um, we also have the keyword search functionality. So you can search for any combination of words that you want across tens of millions of news articles just by tapping it into our platform. And I mean, you demoed the panic index so for instance the panic index was was uh, built using a uh, combination of words so we we wanted to create something that provides a gauge of extreme public mood and so the panic index was uh, is actually a normalized count of articles containing words like panic frenzy hysteria commentioned together with covid um uh, so why don't we now turn to your main results no problem 
Um, I guess before going into uh, the actual tables of our results, I wanted to show you how we selected our, I guess, our sample set. First off, I guess we, like I mentioned, we ran cross country as well as panel regressions on 48 countries. And these 48 countries are the countries that are included in the MSCI All Country World Index. And why 48 and not 49 of the full list of countries is because we excluded Hong Kong as the COVID infection information was, I guess, unavailable, or you could say they were unsuitable for use from where we downloaded. And the sample period chosen for analysis is from January 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2020. And we stopped our analysis in for this uh, particular result that we're, we're displaying today is that at the as of the end of October, because we didn't want it to be sort of uh, influenced by the US presidential elections that took place in November 2020. And also because most or several countries have already started the vaccination programs by December. So cutting it off at the end of October and trying to reduce as much as possible other influences that might have come into play, right? Uh, we are of course considering extension of our sample period to the different um, waves of the coronavirus that would incorporate additional data even up to this point in time. Now for the MSCI countries, that are, they also have their sub-regional and regional uh, se separations. You can see here, they do have three regions, the Americas, Europe and Middle East, Pacific for the developed markets, and for emerging markets, the Americas, EMEA, as well as Asia. So I just wanted you to understand the number of countries in each of these subcategories. And of course, you can actually run analysis either on the regions or by subregions, which is what we've done. In terms of using the intraday data that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we needed to know the exact time zone that uh, each of these countries are at because the data actually uh, obtained for Raven Pack indices are at, I guess they offer it at different time zones. Uh, for, I guess, different GMT times. And we need to actually isolate and select the relevant information for the particular geographic region's close of market. And so we have the time zones listed here for all the 48 countries that we looked at, the indices that we're looking at, which is the main stock price index for the particular country, as well as their market close rounded to the nearest hour because we're using hourly data and not minute by minute data. And the ACAPS data that I mentioned that I use for government measures includes uh, five categories, which is uh, items related to social distancing, items related to movement restrictions, items related to public health measures, and items related to social and economic measures that are implemented during the, during the pandemic, as well as lockdowns. But we have excluded lockdowns in our particular analysis for now because there was no data on lockdowns available for the US. And I'm thinking it's mostly because lockdowns were more regions or maybe city or state specific rather than on a national basis. So I think the, un the inavailability of the data for lockdowns made it such that I only use four of the ACAPS uh, government measures. Now, before discussing the results of our, our analysis, I'll give you a main summary of our findings. Based on our analysis, we found that the US COVID information was the primary driver for equity markets around the world. So in particular, we find that the Raven Pack Panic Index, after controlling for non-coronavirus related information via the US residuals, as well as the ACAPS government measures, was found to be highly significant for all 48 countries that we examine. So this potentially sort of demonstrates the influence of the US on the global equity markets as some sort of global COVID risk factor. Now, turning to the cross country regressions, um, this is the main regression equation that we use, but uh, we also talk about how you re you would replace in that main equation that I've shown here using the regional or sub-regional or global for the different uh, variations of the runs. And if you're incorporating the US residuals 
then you would actually run an additional regression to get the residuals from the regression and incorporate it as an additional variable into this main uh, regression equation. So looking at the panic index uh, results, as you can see here, uh, the US panic is shown in these red boxes and the local panic uh, coefficients are shown in these blue boxes. You can say that the US panic across developed markets Americas, developed markets Pacific, Europe and Middle East developed markets, emerging markets Americas, emerging market Asia, and even emerging markets EMEA, that they're all highly significant, right? Mostly at the 1% level, or for some, maybe like UAE is a 5%. The only exception, of course, was Qatar that didn't show up. But then even the local panic index did not seem to capture uh, the stock price movements for Qatar as well, right? So generally, it seems that the US panic information is more dominant than the local panic information in, in most cases. So that is an interesting uh, result that we obtained. And now we wanted to also look at regressions on a panel basis using pooling, uh, mainly because there's possibility of there being um, heterogeneity across countries. So incorporating a panel regression with country effect. So it's all the, the setup is pretty much the same. It's just that I'm going to run it in a panel format. And the results shown here, I've separated e either the global into developed and emerging uh, distinctions or to the three separate regions, Americas, Europe, and Asia. And you can see here that when you run it just with the local panic, in, and by difference in panic, I mean the weekly difference in panic, uh, you see here that the panic index does not seem to impact or does not have significance in explaining uh, stock market indices. But when we, we start adding the, the US COVID information through the US panic index, you can see the significance is there. And even when I control for non COVID related information for the US, you can still see that uh, it survives even this uh, variation. And it seems to be uniform across all the different uh, air regions, Americas, Europe, and Asia, the two distinctions of developed and emerging countries, and even when you run it, run the full set using the global. Now, in terms of using the hourly, mar hourly data for, for uh, the panic index, uh, I've looked at matching the market close for the different countries. So this run could be seen as a more conservative approach to the previous model. And by conservative, I mean you're trying to match the information content at the specific point of time of market close. So you don't you do not let additional information that might have come out maybe a few hours later because I'm choosing an arbitrary close time for the whole global economy. Right. So when I control for this, I look at the hourly rib impact data, and then I'm comparing it to the actual market close time for that particular country that we're looking at. And when I run the pooled regression using these hourly controlled, you can see that the local panic index seems to have increased in uh, its significance. Previously, there were none, right, for both global as well as developed and Europe. However, when you, you can still see here, when you add the panic index in, the, the US information seems to be more significant and it still survives even after controlling using the US residuals and of course the government measures. So it seems that um, this robustness test has, shows that it's still the relationship that we've discovered using the daily data is still valid. That's very interesting. I mean, I know you are still working on this, but do you have any intuition for the rationale? Why is the US effect so significant across the board and whatever robustness checks you do? Uh, well, I mean, like I mentioned at the beginning, we did run this uh, not solely only using the Raven Pack indices, but also using uh, effective reproduction rate and the infection rate. But uh, I guess 
it's our results are sort of in line with prior literature in terms of, um, I guess, a contagion effect of U.S. sort of uh, impacting other countries, be it developed or emerging markets, particularly for emerging markets in the prior research. And in, you could think of this contagion effect as sort of coming through in different ways. Um, it could be from information asymmetry between informed and uninformed investors. Uh, it could be through uh, a wealth effect or what we call a reduced risk-bearing ability or capacity by the different uh, financial institutions due to the coronavirus, or maybe even the differences in the investor base effect. So from a financial market contagion point of view, uh, you can think of this as there being asymmetry in the contagion effect. What do I mean by this is if you separate the group of investors to informed and uninformed, uh, there could be confusion by the uninformed investors as to what signal they're actually receiving when they're selling, seeing a sell-off. And as such, what would happen is they will just be universally selling their securities in sort of like a risk-off scenario, right? And that will put downward pressure. But so they're looking at the U.S., taking a signal from there and doing their sell-off on all their equity holdings on a general basis. Or maybe it's, if, it's an, if you think about it in terms of funds, mutual funds, they would have maybe a global mutual fund would have all of their holdings in both. I guess the exposure will be in the U.S. as well as other countries, but they'll be selling their um, high-risk assets or basically their equity holdings. And that will lead to that sell-out. So it's irrespective of whether or not the local situation is has, I guess, worsened or has improved. It's more like they're taking cues and signals from the U.S. So you can see how this contagion effect can actually impact it. However, of course, uh, in order to get a, a more precise understanding of how this contagion transmission is occurring, uh, as I mentioned, this research is still in progress. So we will be running additional analysis using fund flow and maybe equity flow data to see if that's, that is the actual contagion mechanism that occurred, or perhaps it could be something else that has occurred. Interesting. Um, you just showed us the results with the panic indices. Um, I remember you also used the sentiment ones. Um, do you find similar results or um, what do you find? In general, uh, I guess the panic indices uh, produce a more uh, significant result. The sentiment indices gave a more mixed result. And I've, I have a feeling it could be due to the fact of the way the, the indices are measured. And it's... While I do feel both of them are relevant, I guess this, the panic index were the ones that were uniformly more consistent in all our, our analysis as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that because the panic index is basically an outright gauge of COVID-related panic, whereas the sentiment is a relative index because it's constructing by looking at the difference between the sentiment of events in stories that mention COVID and the median sentiment in uh, of events in stories that do not mention COVID. So I think I'm not surprised that you find the panic index performing better because I think the sentiment might be more useful in settings where we would be looking at the relative performance of, say, a basket of COVID-sensitive stocks versus COVID-unrelated stocks rather than the overall index. So maybe another interesting research question to explore here. Um, um, I also, I'm, I'm also curious because uh, we started by talking about this difference between how markets are pricing um, uh, the COVID news charter versus how they price more traditional data such as infection reproduction rates. Did you, um, do you find higher or lower explanatory power for uh, the first or second type of regressions? And uh, did you try a regression that includes both? Uh, we've we've done so. Uh, we've actually incorporated uh, uh, or compared uh, both the runs using the Raven Pack Panic Index and Sentiment Indices, or using infection-related information through the reproduction rate or infection rate. Uh, and in general, while I did find that 
the relevance or maybe that significance, statistical significance is much higher using the panic uh, and in general, more uniform in terms of what its results were actually telling us. Um, I think it could be because if you look at inf infection related information, which is more, which is more just data as is, right? So how many people were infected today? How many people have um, unfortunately passed away? How many new cases have formed, right? How many have recovered? I think it it is more like a reported data set and not fully reflective of what investors might be thinking of. Yes, it does impact them, which is why there was significance. But I think in terms of trying to understand whether or not that fully influenced stock prices, I think it does, um, uh, as our results have shown as well, it does it does less so or performs less accurately as the panic in this has actually done. And in terms of combined runs, I've decided we did run them, uh, but I guess the dif difficulty in trying to interpret the results is because of the fact that there is high correlation between the panic index and sentiment index, as well as with the, co the COVID uh, infection related information, because when you incorporate things like uh, keyword searches through your panic index, panic, hysteria, and COVID. And this panic could have been caused by the infection numbers increasing substantially. So trying to separate out that correlation, uh, I guess we could run residuals to try to do that as well, but it will make a little bit more difficult to interpret the data, data as is. And that's why we chose not to run them uh, together in, the, in our regression model. And I guess in any case, we did run the robustness with using either panic, sentiment, or R0, the effective reproduction rate, or the infection rate. So we've looked at different variations to see whether or not uh, that particular measure helps explain uh, stock price move movements for that period. That all makes sense. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, one final question for me. Um, uh, before we get to the Q&A. As I mentioned at the beginning, you, uh, before becoming an academic, you worked for over 15 years in the finance industry and in many different areas ranging from risk management, equity valuations, market analysis, modeling, pricing, structuring, interest rates, FX, commodities, credit, etc. Uh, so could you tell us a bit more about uh, the practical relevance of your results? I mean, how could practitioners in the finance industry leverage your research? Well, for this particular research, I feel that the results obtained would be particularly pertinent for asset managers, because I, like I mentioned, the contagion effect and how that might affect, um, I guess, fund sell-offs and I guess, buying or selling of, of mutual funds or even stocks uh, due to changes in the pandemic situation in different countries. And I guess what I would like to recognize is there are other research that actually did find maybe there's a large domestic component to this current crisis. However, from an equity market return standpoint, if you look at our, the res, if you tr trust our analysis and its results, basically it's telling us that we should still look at the U.S. related information a lot more closely than we might have, and putting so you shouldn't put less weight on uh, U.S. information and, and more on local, but actually do the reverse. And uh, in general, I guess uh, when I look at these uh, types of um, analysis, especially given the current situation. Uh, I mean, there's a, Professor Paul Krugman has, o has always said, the stock market is not the economy. So the relationship between how, stock, uh, how stocks perform, uh, it's gonna be driven, driven by different sentiments in, by the market participants, be it greed, fear, uh, and whatnot. But real economic growth, as you see it, from the economic numbers that are reported by the governments, it's always somewhere that's a little bit more loosely related to market participants' uh, viewpoint. And we shouldn't forget as well, right? I mean, I'm not as 
taking as strong a point as Professor Krugman, but uh, I guess my my view is that the stock market and the economy gives you a, a different viewpoint. First off, I guess stock markets are forward looking. So you're not trading on the basis of it went up today, but you're trading on the basis of it will go up in the future, right? And that is different in terms of how uh, you need to understand how panic will creep in. What panic does is an overall sense of deproving market conditions and the stock market will tend to, tend to fall because due to selling or risk off situations. Well, if you believe that we will return to some state of normalcy soon in the near future, then you, they'll, you'll see a rally in the market due to that sentiment itself. So I do know um, that traditional finance theorists or economists might, might roll their eyes when we talk about behavioral, behavioral aspects of uh, investing. However, it is shown empirically to be important. So we can't just fully ignore them. And even with the rapid recovery of the stock markets that we've seen, so with the fall last March and with with reaching new highs by the by the start of this year, uh, you should not uh, discount the fact that the COVID pandemic is just an overreaction, and now is the correction because crisis situations are difficult to analyze using fundamental factors as we would normally like to do. And you need to rely on other sorts of information that might have impacted or influenced the market. Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with you. And on this point about uh, market narratives versus economic data, that's that's something I'm, I'm working on. And I think another good example right now is inflation. I mean, look at inflation data, um, inflation is not there yet. And there is actually a lot of disagreement about whether and when exactly it's going to come. But I was checking the reflation narrative and in Revenpack, and I can see it started getting substantial momentum from around September last year. And that's what markets are playing around. They're playing the reflation trade. Um, OK, thank you so much, Dr. Kang, for, for all your answers. I find it really really interesting i'm really looking forward to the final paper um i have more questions of course but i'm not gonna be that selfish um so let's now look at the questions from our listeners hello everyone welcome back to the q a session now um so we have 10 minutes for questions and we have received a number of super interesting questions and comments so let's just uh, kick start. So one question um, on machine learning models. What machine learning models did you use for your inferences? For instance, did you look into reinforcement learning, uh, LSTM, RNN, k-means clustering, or more simple multivariable correlations? Well, our analysis did not use machine learning models per se. So we just used the actual, because at the actual returns, mainly because we're trying to not predict, but explain what might have caused those market movements in, or impacts on stock returns. So I guess in terms of a more forecasting based model, we will probably need to incorporate machine learning models to see if that might be something that can help explain it. But uh, no, unfortunately not for this particular study, we, have, we haven't used uh, machine learning models per se. Okay, um, so then we had a follow-up question uh, on what um, what did you use for your price predictions? So, like I mentioned, it's not a predictor. Uh, we're trying to actually just explain what might have caused it and what the main information drivers were. Um, I guess, given uh, the context of uh, a, a lot of our participants, they might be more interested in terms of predicting or forecasting power. And I guess, to do a more robust forecasting analysis, we need to employ more of an asset pricing model. And we have done so in an, a separate study that we have done uh, that looked at the market risk of pandemic. Um, and in that study, we have actually run um, an analysis using a model with the pharma French three factor model, as well as incorporation of a pandemic risk factor. And that pandemic risk factor was uh, varied between either the effective uh, 
reproduction rate using the R0, infection rate, or the Raven Pack panic indices. And what we've done, we've, what we've noticed in our uh, results is that we found positive and statistically significant um, coefficients for the risk premium for the panic indices. So, so that difference in panic was actually showing up to be giving a positive risk premium. So using a model such as that, we will be able to more accurately forecast going forward. And I guess incorporation of more of a machine learning model might be something to consider as well. But I guess uh, we just relied on a, a more asset pricing, traditional asset pricing model for that. OK, cool. Yeah, I guess from a quant strategy perspective, that's kind of the type of insights we are also looking for. Uh, we also have a, an interesting comment that maybe you can you can comment on. So let me read it out. Um, more of a comment than a question. It could help to test the internal validity of the OLS models you use. If you do a quick calculation of the correlation between US panning and lo local panic indices, if they are highly correlated, the conclusions needed to be adjusted to take that high correlation into account. Also, adding a variety of models, including and excluding some variables, can help reach uh, correct conclusions. I also suggest instrumenting US panic for local panic variable, as the only direction of panic index affecting the other one is US leading to local and not the other way around. So um, I guess um, the, um, uh, the person asking is really trying to get into whether you used IV, whether um, I know you are controlling for US residuals already, but I will let you comment on that. Sure. Um, I guess using IVs is something that we're considering as well. Um, we haven't done that um, because I guess the concern is whether or not the model itself using OLS, I guess the analysis using OLS is, is going to be valid if there's high correlation, like you mentioned, between the local and the US panic information. And you would anticipate that there would be quite a high correlation, right? Um, I guess, especially in the second wave. Uh, if you look at the first wave, most likely Asia moved more than, I guess, the panic indices in the U.S. Uh, and probably from Asia, it would have moved on to Europe when the Europe situation was getting worse initially before the U.S. So I guess what we're trying to do is maybe looking at the different waves to see. And it might be that the first few first wave was a. Uh, there'll be less correlation between the local and local panic and US panic, but maybe in the second wave, there'll be higher correlation between uh, local panic and US panic. So I guess that's another element that we might want to consider running, but I guess we'll be more focused on trying to determine the major drivers. And I, know, I do understand that uh, using IVs will be something that will be very helpful in trying to pinpoint or better determine whether or not that impact was influenced or not. Great. Um, so another one here is um, the panic indexes you use in your research are directly related to COVID. Uh, given the unprecedented and unpredictable nature of events like COVID, how could asset managers try to incorporate this type of risk factors into their models ex ante? Is it fair to say that your work shows the importance of focusing on US related risk factors? Well, I mean, the role of U.S. as a driver or for movements of international stock markets um, due to the spillover effect from the U.S. stock markets to the other markets has been sort of documented in other prior literature. And I guess of one particular note is the research done by Rapach, Strauss and Zaus in 2013. I guess they showed that many non-U.S. industrialized countries uh, with the, the lagged U.S. returns significantly predict returns better than those of the country's own economic variables. I do know that these studies are not particularly related to uh, news analytics data and more on a traditional economic variable uh, sense, but uh, I guess they have also seen this lagged effect of the U.S. impacting the, US, the local markets more than the local economic variables themselves. So even that with the combination of the results that we have actually, I guess, I, I presented today in our in our presentation, I guess it is prudent that you would take the U.S.-based indices and U.S.-based information more uh, to give it more credence than I guess we might have if you're actually looking at lo pure local investments. 
Perfect. Well, I think we've covered um, the questions. Um, with this, I want to thank um, all of our audience for joining. Um, I really hope you found this session interesting and useful. I certainly learned a lot. Um, in my own research, I'm currently focused on building macro narratives that drive um, the markets. And so one particular interesting insight that I'm taking away with me today is the importance of monitoring um, extreme, uh, extreme public modes. And um, so, of course, um, as, as that question hinted, um, the, the COVID index, the panic index we, di we discussed today is um, COVID related. But um, because Revenpack tracks uh, thousands of different event categories, including terrorist attacks, natural disasters, epidemics, etc., I can see how we could potentially even create some thematic panic indexes or even a broader one that captures kind of a general sense of history and fears, or we could even uh, change, flip the, the language, flip, flip the vocabulary that we're looking for and capture optimism and euphoria. Um, so it's certainly um, a lot of very uh, interesting and inspire, inspiring research insights today. So thank you, Dr. Kong, and many thanks to also your co-authors for the research and, and discussing it today with me. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and I'd like to thank Raven Pack for organizing this event. And it was a, I hope that, uh, I guess, it, it sort of shows how Raven Pack data can be used in an academic setting for research purposes as well. Terrific. Um, before we close, um, just please note that this session has been recorded and will be made available after the event. And also you have some interesting materials on the right side of your screen, which you can download. And those include the slides prepared by Dr. Kong for today's session, a video introducing our coronavirus media monitor and two papers from our quant research team. And with that, thanks again, everyone for joining and have a lovely rest of the week. Thank you.